The agenda for today is here in front of you. Um, we will start with some welcome remarks by our global coordinator, Rainer Horn, and our um, GNSS Asia Taiwan project manager, Angela Xiao, um, which will be followed by an introduction on what the EU is actually doing in using GNSS for uh, UTM solutions, uh, presented by Ms. Aguilera Rios from the European GNSS Agency. That will be followed by a presentation from uh, uh, our partners in Taiwan, from the Taiwanese side, um, with representatives from the Ministry of uh, Transport. And then we'll have a, a panel discussion, which will be interactive, moderated by Mr. Reiner Horn, where we will have uh, speakers uh, from the Jung uh, Christian University, Dr. Chang, um, Kun Mulemann from Unifly, a European UTM service provider already. Um, we have Dr. Lee from a Taiwan drone company called Erdbook, and Mr. Bauerhin from Space Opal in Europe. This will be followed by a Q&A session, and we're very happy to welcome you here today. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the GNSS Asia team being here for you, currently the people framed in yellow are, have joined us. We have a team member from uh, Taiwan and even a team member from Korea in the call, of course, Angela, uh, and also um, myself, Reiner, and Julia, but also Alistair, who are uh, at your disposal today. Um, without any further ado, I would be glad to give the floor to uh, Reiner Horn as our global coordinator. So good morning, everybody. Ni hao. Um, my name is Reiner Horn, Managing Partner of Space Tech Partners and Global Coordinator of GNSS Asia since 2012. We're now going into the ninth year of GNSS Asia. And from the start, Taiwan was part of it. Angela was part of it from the start. Um, we're very pleased to uh, enter now into the aerial space, for, I think for the first time, um, at least in Taiwan. Um, so far, we've done a number of workshops in the area of smart cities, ITS, and location-based services over the, over the years. As Chinese Asia, we're working on industrial cooperation. We help supporting institutional relations between Europe and Asia. And we're promoting uh, GNSS and multi-GNSS, um, seeing how space can enable digitization and enable automation of processes in institutional and industrial context. So thank you for joining today. I would like to hand over today and now to um, Angela, um, and uh, she will give you a perspective from the Taiwanese side. Thank you. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Angela Xiao, a Taiwan team leader. So in recent years, Taiwan has the ambition to develop the autonomous driving technology and its supply chain to airspace, which echoes with the global market and technology trends. Based on a completed ecosystem of supply chain and a strong uh, ICT industry, Taiwan is on the way to build a vibrant a UAV ecosystem. In this slide, um, I just give you a brief uh, introduction on um, Taiwan has been working with public and private key stakeholders to co-promote uh, DNS related applications and enhance EU Taiwan industrial cooperation. In recent years, we organized several flagship events such as the EU Taiwan Smart Mobility Seminar in 2016 and 2018. We were in cooperation with MOTC and attended by high level EU and Taiwan officials, key companies and research institutions. We also supported individual companies and institutions for matchmaking meetings, help them to identify potential partners for business cooperation. Next. So uh, in the next slide, there are uh, European and Taiwanese we have been working with through GNS Asia. Um, you can see from the left side uh, the recent uh, institute and also companies that we've been working with, and then we help, help them to cooperate with the uh, European uh, entities in, in the right side. And we will continue to support both sides for more industrial cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. Now. Um, Setting the scene for the workshop, um, I think as everyone present here knows, uh, the use of commercial and recreational drones in Taiwan 
but also globally is, is growing very rapidly. This has been one of um, our takeaways as a project um, through our research and the market technology trends that we provide. We've seen the same developments happening in Korea, in India, um, um, uh, even in Japan currently. There are a variety of application domains using, using drones uh, downstream. And we've seen that recently, um, Taiwan Civil Aeronautics Administration, of whom we have distinguished guests here today, have recently updated uh, drone regulations. The same is happening in Europe. Also on our side in Europe, we see that the revenues of the drone market are expected to double in, in only two years with use cases in a variety of areas from agriculture to goods delivery and critical infrastructure. And uh, the European Union is developing a fully integrated UTM by 2035 under uh, the umbrella term use space. And I'm sure that Carmen can share more on that. Now, what are the objectives of today's workshop for us? First and foremost, we see this as an opportunity to exchange views on these upcoming regulations between Taiwan and Europe, but with particular attention to the specific use of GNSS in this regard. Uh, second, um, we want to uh, demonstrate to our uh, partners from Taiwan what the concrete added value is um, of uh, our European GNSS technologies, uh, both Galileo and, and our ESPA solutions as um, uh, GNSS constellations, but also downstream service providers. And third, um, in the panel discussion, we'll present mutual GNSS driven solutions in this area. So this is what we have uh, on the uh, calendar for today. And um, without any further ado, uh, we would be honored to give the floor um, um, to Carmen from the European GNSS Agency to present the situation in Europe. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to GNSS Asia for inviting me to this uh, workshop. It is a pleasure being here to discuss uh, with you the future of uh, UTM and in particular how GNSS and European GNSS can contrib contribute to better setup of uh, UTM. So as Hans introduced me, I'm Carmen Aguilera, I'm responsible for safety critical applications in the European GNSS Agency and I will give you a quick overview of the uh, UTM uh, progress in Europe and uh, what we are doing from the European Commission and GSA side uh, to uh, increase uh, the use of uh, GNSS. Next slide. Uh, this is a quick overview of the services of uh, EGNOS and uh, Galileo as of uh, today and the, the services that are planned uh, to be provided uh, in the near future. Uh, in particular, Galileo. Galileo is the European GNSS um, system, is offering a wide range, range of services. Um, I'm sure most of the participants already know, but uh, just a quick uh, reminder. The open service is the Galileo open and free of charge uh, service. Initial services are already operational since uh, 2016 and is providing positioning and timing services. It is important to highlight that, that the open service uh, will soon also provide what we call uh, open service authentication. We will see it afterwards. That is uh, providing uh, additional uh, security measures or uh, authentication of the signal embedded in the, in the open service. The high accuracy service is going to provide uh, increased accuracy uh, in the decimeter level. This uh, service is under development. The search and rescue service is the European contribution to COSPAR-SARSAT in order to increase um, search and rescue efficiency of search and rescue operations. And finally, the public regulated service is targeted authorized users. And uh, we cannot forget about EGNOS. EGNOS is uh, the European Geostationary Navigation Overlay Service. It is a service that is uh, provided only over Europe. However, there are many similar regional initiatives also provided in other regions of the world. If we can go to next slide. I just want to highlight that, that uh, even if uh, Galileo is uh, in initial services status, status, it reached uh, almost uh, 2 billion users already in four years of operations. And uh, here you have a split of the different market segments. But if we look already at uh, the drones market segment, uh, we realized that already more than 30% of the drone uh, receiver models that are available on the market are implementing Galileo. So it is already possible to use uh, Galileo for drones operations and for, and for UTN. It is not a future technology, but it is already available uh, there and available in the market for any service developer or, or application developer. 
And if we look at the global market for, for drones and the GNSS, why it is so important for the GSA and also for the European Commission to develop a, a market for uh, eGNSS in drones. Well, as is what in, was introduced uh, in the, by the GNSS Asia coordination, the market uh, will reach more than 10 billion euro by 2035, uh, creating more than 100,000 jobs. Uh, these are the estimations for Europe, uh, but can be extrapolated to other areas of the world, especially in Taiwan, where the technology is developing very fast. And uh, what uh, we see is that the uh, GNSS is not an option anymore, but the uh, GNSS is included in uh, almost uh, all drone models. And, uh, and uh, as I said before, already more than 30% are including Galileo and ECMOS. What is important also to highlight is that uh, GNSS is uh, not an option and is needed also for uh, ambitious operations, especially for oper demanding applications uh, such as um, navigation beyond the line of sight or applications where the, there is a high need of uh, a sea and resilient uh, navigation. GNSS is normally combined uh, with other technologies uh, to ensure that the positioning is uh, robust, but uh, basically it is a commodity and is already included in most of the, of the devices. We envision that the global market uh, will reach more than 50 million units by 2029, so more than 50 GNSS receivers will be installed uh, on board and drone platforms by 2029, which is a big market that can be exploited when deploying UTM technologies. We can go to the next one. And actually, it is if we look at the global market for GNSS, also uh, drones is the largest, uh, largest market for GNSS following lo location-based services and road. What you can see in the graph on the left part of the slide is the global installed uh, base by segment of GNSS receivers. The blue line uh, corresponds to location-based services. The green is uh, for road applications. And the rest are displayed in the graphs on the right side. And you can see that for all the other applications, drones is the biggest market that we expect to deploy for, for GNSS. In fact, uh, we, if we have a quick look at uh, the status of uh, regulation in Europe, uh, the, the following slides are taken from the European Aviation Safety Agency. We are classifying the applications and the type of operations of drones according to what we call categories. And uh, we are defining three main categories that are called open, specific and certified categories. The open category corresponds to applications that are considered of low risk and there is no pre-authorization needed and normally are uh, operations of flying, flying in the visual line of sight with a maximum height of 120 meters, uh, keeping distance for people. So these are, these are the, let's say, uh, easier or uh, applications. However, already for these applications, it is necessary to implement the geo-awareness and remote ID broadcasting that we will see, we'll see after. And I'm sure the colleagues from Unifly will explain which solutions based on GNSS they, all, they are already providing to, to provide the geo-awareness and the remote uh, ID. The next uh, category is the so-called specific category that is uh, for uh, operations uh, with increased uh, risk, so typically package delivery. And, and finally, the certified category that is, uh, uh, is uh, the one that has a higher risk and is more similar for manned aviation. Next slide. In Europe, the new, the new European regulation came into force uh, on the 31st of December 2020. It's already available in the EASA website and is addressing the main, the main uh, regulations, uh, mainly also for open and specific category. And if we go to the next slide, we see again, this slide is also from my colleagues uh, from the European um, Aviation Safety Agency. In Europe, we are now deploying the regulations for the certified categories. So, so these are the big drones expected to uh, carry uh, packages and also are dedicated to transport of people and also uh, cargo. And this regulation is expected to be developed in the next years in order to come into to enter into operations by in different milestones, but certainly by 2030, 2035. Next slide. Well, why it's EGNSS or EGNOS and Galileo provide benefits for UIS and for UTM? And I categorize the, the benefits in four main, four main categories. The first one is availability. 
wi availability if we see that most of the operations of drones will be taking place in uh, cities or in challenging environments uh, where there are there will be many obstacles in this case having a strong uh, several uh, gnss services uh, in view increases the availability of the positioning and this is ensured by multi constellation solutions at the receiver level Increased accuracy, also if uh, the, many of the upcoming drone operations uh, require high accuracy to keep the safe operation of the drone, but also in order to implement uh, efficient uh, UTM solutions, we need to ensure that the position of the drone is accurate. Well, for this, uh, Galileo is providing the high accuracy service that I mentioned before, and also is providing a dual frequency that uh, enables that the position that is calculated is uh, much more precise. Also, it is important to look at integrity. Integrity is a measure of the trust that we can put in the position of the of a new IS. And uh, this is also this is ensured by GNSS and also by integration of GNSS with other sensors. If we want to have efficient uh, UTM and the uh, demanding um, UIS applications uh, in place, it is important to implement uh, this kind of uh, solution inside the, the drone and the UTM uh, services. And finally, authentication. We need to be aware that there are a number of uh, risks or poten potential threats that will be affecting UAS operations. And the, the Galileo system is going to provide uh, what we call uh, the um, OS authentication service that uh, will be a digital signature embedded in the signal of uh, Galileo that uh, will, will make sure so that the user can make sure that he is using the information or the positioning information coming from not Galileo from Galileo and not from a, from a fake source. So these are the reasons to use to use Galileo. We go to next slide. In fact, for availability that I was mentioning before, we can see already that, that most of the receivers are implementing all the GNSS solutions. So, so GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, they do. So this is something that is already available in the market. Next slide. For accuracy, uh, there are already many receivers in the market that, that, are, that are also implementing the different uh, frequencies that, that uh, are provided by, by GNSS. So we don't need to develop any new receivers, but in order to use multi-frequency solution, we can already rely on, on receivers that are available in the market. Next one, for integrity. Indeed, for integrity, we need uh, to do a bit of more work. Um, actually, in Europe, we are doing a lot of uh, research and development in order to develop the integrity concept for drone operations so that we can put a measure of the trust on the, pos on the position of the, of the drone. If uh, you look at the left side of the slide where you see a manned uh, aircraft, as of today, we already have an integrity concept for manned aviation to ensure that the landing of a, of a manned aircraft is safe. And we are trying to adapt uh, the same concept to, uh, to the operations of, uh, of drones. Next one, and the, the last uh, point that I, want, I was highlighting is uh, authentication. So I was saying with the Galileo authentication, the users can verify that the signal that uh, the drone is using for computing the position is actually coming from the Galileo satellite and, in, and not uh, from a fake uh, source, which is unfortunately becoming more and more common. Actually, in GSA, we recently launched a, a research and development program in order to develop a receivers for drones that, that are implementing the Galileo authentication solution. And uh, we are expecting that these receivers will be available in the market uh, quite soon. Uh, if uh, you want to look at uh, the, or you want to see specific uh, measures and calculations of the performance benefits of using GPS and Galileo versus GPS only. You can have a look at the white paper on drones that we published uh, in, the, in the GSA uh, last year. This is available in the GSA website and uh, also at the different projects that have been funded by the European Commission. We can give you the details offline if needed. I would like to highlight just one figure in the from the report, if you look at the table at the 
bottom of the slide, you can see one example of one of the flights that we performed in order to compare the, the uh, accuracy or the, the error that was achieved when using GPS only and GPS plus uh, Galileo in a, in a specific operation. And we saw that the, the, the error when using uh, GPS plus Galileo together was much lower than when using GPS alone. And as we were saying before, this is especially relevant if we are planning operations in cities or in areas uh, with uh, many obstacles so where we need to ensure that the, the error of the positioning is, uh, is minimum and the availability of GNSS is, is maximized. But uh, you have a more um, comparison and more figures in the, in the paper. And the, in the next slides, I would like to give you just a glimpse of research and development uh, activities that uh, we are doing now in, in Europe in order to promote the use of uh, EGNSS. And uh, this slide uh, represents uh, one example. This is the case of the DeLorean project. It's a project that we are funding under the Horizon 2020 program. It's the same program that is funding GNSS Asia and that is uh, looking at the, is uh, developing the future urban air mobility by using GNSS. So we are developing here solutions for uh, package delivery and also for uh, air taxi in cooperation with uh, Airbus for, uh, for uh, uh, urban air delivery and uh, urban air mobility and also with Correos and that is the national post, uh, post company or mail company in, in Spain. And both of them are using the uh, different uh, Galileo features that, that, uh, that we were proposing, that we were describing um, before. If we go to the next one, this is another example of uh, um, research and development activities that uh, we are doing in, in Europe. And this is uh, the TRACE project. Uh, this uh, project is developing a smart drone beacon based on GNSS for use space. So in brief, what the project is developing is a beacon that can be that is put on board the UAV and is uh, broadcasting the position of the UAV to the U space or UTM uh, service providers and also to other uh, devices in the, in their space so that we can keep uh, it is used for geo awareness and geolocation and uh, it is also used in order to increase the efficiency of the use of the airspace. So, for example, when with, what we are testing now is that uh, when the beacon is using uh, EGNOS and uh, Galileo, the position of the drone is much more accurate, and therefore the UTM service provider can put more drones in the same in the same airspace because the separation, the vertical and horizontal separation, is is much better. Uh, finally, also we are trying to um, promote innovation in uh, in SMEs in Europe. Uh, so we recently launched a, a competition that we call uh, My Galileo Tron that is aiming to um, encourage entrepreneurs and startups to develop uh, solutions for use space and the applications and services benefiting from from Galileo Tron from uh, from Galileo. We are now in the during the semifinals. And uh, we plan to announce uh, the the finalists and uh, by the end of uh, of January. And uh, I think I'm running out of time. So Han, maybe you can go to the yes, uh, to, I just have uh, two slides missing. If you want to find more information on Galileo services, uh, you can go to the gsc.eu website where you can find information about Galileo. And finally, in the next slide. If we want to do, to look, no, back, this one, yes. If uh, you want to know which uh, uh, receivers and drones are, have already Galileo implemented in commercial products, uh, you can check uh, in these uh, two websites uh, that are also developed by the GSA, the .galile, usegalileo.eu and uh, the My Galileo Drone Competition website where we have listed all the receivers that are already embedding Galileo and are useful for drones and uh, which commercial commercial drones come already out of the factory with uh, with Galileo capabilities. And of course uh, I will be available for any question and discussion 
And uh, and if you need any more information, please let me know. I guess uh, we will distribute the, the slides as well in case uh, it is interesting and uh, and you want to, to follow up with more information. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carmen. I would like to give the floor to uh, Reiner to coordinate any questions. So good morning, everybody. Once again, for those who joined a bit later, uh, thank you, Carmen, for giving us that great oversight overview of what's happening uh, from the GSA side. Uh, for our speakers, I guess we, we learned that the GSA is a wealth of information and also a funding source for advanced research with GMSS as an enabling technology in there. Um, check out the websites, there's much more to be found. And of course, we will share the presentation afterwards for your reference. We had one related question from um, here in the chat that I'd like to quickly pose to Carmen. Um, if I understand the question correctly, it's about to what extent can the GNSS service for UAS and UTM also be used in, um, in Taiwan? Is it a European thing only, or would it also work in Taiwan, Carmen? Well, when it comes to, to Galileo, so Galileo is a, is a global service, so indeed they can be used in Taiwan as well. And actually, most of the commercial receivers and commercial drones are already implementing Galileo, so it, is, it can be used in Taiwan. In Taiwan. Also, uh, solutions for uh, space that is how we call UTM in, in Europe, are uh, global solutions and can be also used uh, in Taiwan. Actually, we will have in the, during the panel discussion, we will have uh, one uh, European UTM uh, provider, Unifly, that will present uh, the solutions uh, that are already including EGNOS and Galileo and that are also available for Taiwan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carmen, for introducing that. Are there any other questions for the um, are there any questions for Carmen? I guess Carmen, you'll probably also be available later when we have a more open panel discussion. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Uh, Rainer, I see one question in the chat that is asking about the quantification. Um, yes, uh, quantification of the measurement of accuracy, availability, integrity, like aviation to be used for U UAA, UAD and the UTM. So actually for this information, I would recommend to have a look first at the, at the drone white paper that I was introducing in the presentation. I will put the link in the, in the chat immediately that is already providing a quantification of the benefits that you can obtain when using uh, GPS and Galileo versus uh, GPS only. Also, uh, the European Commission funded a, a, a project that, that it was looking into, into this topic, and we will post uh, the, the link to the, to the results. And this can be the, the basis for starting the analysis. Okay, very good. So, um, thank you for clarifying those questions. Um, and we'll keep the chat open to if new things are coming up. The next session will be presented by two speakers from Taiwan's Ministry of Transportation and Communications, MOTC. Mr. Hua Gen, Senior Analyst Civil Aeronautics Administration, MOTC, will introduce us Taiwan's regulatory framework and experiences regarding drone operation and certifications. So I will give the floor to Mr. Gen. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you for the flow. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Hua Ken, and I am the coordinator in drone management team uh, in CAA Taiwan. Uh, today, I am going to talk about the regulatory framework and the experience regarding drone operations and certification in Taiwan, and how to seek the implementation of remote ID or other possible solutions such as the Galileo's to improve the safety and the security in drone operations. And the first, uh, please, next. Uh, next slide, yes. Uh, first, uh, uh, we are coming from the some profiles and the statistics data uh, to introduce the uh, status quo in Taiwan. Uh, you can see that in Taiwan, we have a very, uh, a very similar uh, land area compared with the Beijing. Uh, maybe a lot bit slightly larger and for the population of 23 million uh, people uh, 
uh, for the drone operations, we have a registered drone for uh, 61,000. And uh, for the remote pilot, uh, up to now, we have uh, 6,000 6, uh, remote pilot uh, right now in Taiwan. And for the operators, we have uh, more than uh, 500 operators. Uh, mainly they are doing the uh, photographing, but uh, some of people, uh, they are using the drone to do the survey and the uh, construction, uh, investigation, or other means such as the cargo delivery or other uh, utilizations. Uh, for the airspace, right now we have a uh, because it's a crowded area in Tai uh, in Taiwan sky, so we have a re restricted airspace for more than twenty nine. Uh, most of them are military restri restricted areas, and some of them are for the security reasons. And the, the airport airspace will be for the seventeen air airport. We have a uh, thirty four uh, air uh, airport airspace, which is prohibited uh, drone operations. Uh, for the airfield, which used for the helicopter operations, is more than 50. And then for uh, some areas under the 400 feet, uh, we have uh, the authority to the local government to depict their own no-fly zone. Uh, you can see uh, more than 3,000 uh, areas will be depicted by the and uh, announced by the by the local authorities. This is the uh, general profile for the Taiwan drone operations. Uh, please, next. And with the increasing operations of drones, so we need to have some some kind of arrangement to do the to do the management staff or the oversight. So we have set up the drone regulation regulatory framework, uh, which consists of uh, different uh, areas. For the first one is for the man, we have a remote balance, as I mentioned above. And for the next one, we have the machine uh, for the Maximum takeoff weight under 25 kilogram. We need to be a uh, uh, reg registration, and for the higher, for the heavier uh, drones, more than 25 kilogram, we not only need to be registered, but also we uh, the drones need to be airworthiness certified. And uh, the third one is the method. The method we set up the operation limitations and. Uh, for the increased feasibility for the operators. So we set up some rules to grant exemptions for the operators. Uh, for the environment or mediums, we have a restricted area airspace and how to manage that. Right now, we use the segregated airspace policies, but it is time consuming and it's not very effective. So that's the reason why we need to have some measures such as the navigations, communications, or surveillance tools which can use to measure the position and the, the flight data of the drones and then we can do the management to get a very effective ways to operate uh, please next okay uh, i just quickly brew, uh, browse some details uh, for the man the remote pilot need only to know the knowledge and the skills the knowledge is uh, is done by written test, and for the skill, is written uh, is done by practical test. Uh, for the pilot licensing, right now we have a, a sixty thousand uh, uh, remote pilot license right now in Taiwan, and uh, three uh, thirty thousand of them uh, are professional remote pilot license, which means they passed uh, not only written test but also practical test. Uh, this is the general uh, picture of our personal management right now. Uh, right now, it is very popular in Taiwan to set up the training centers to train the people to familiar with the drone operation techniques and the skills. Next, please. Uh, for the machine, as I mentioned above, we have a reg registration policies. Uh, everything under every drone under the 25 kilogram will be uh, need to be registered. And for the more than 25 kilogram maximum takeoff weight, need to be airworthiness certified. Uh, for the detail of that, please see the next. The next, please. Okay. Uh, for the airworthiness certification approach, we have a commercial or uh, self owned or owner built uh, drones. For the commercial use, we have, uh, which means uh, they, the manufacturer will do that. And then the TAP inspection certificate, uh, which is very equivalent to TAP certificate for the manned aircraft. And uh, for each TAP certificate, we also issue the inspect uh, to 
individual the certification for the purchase, which can get the uh, certificate to operate the drone. And uh, for the owner build, which means uh, which is very popular, but for the uh, for the drone over than twenty five kilograms, uh, it is not so easy to. And uh, they need also be regulated carefully by the certification standards, which uh, we provided the so called the spatial in uh, inspection certificate, which is equivalent to the spatial airworthiness certificate for the manned aircraft. Next, please. Okay, regarding to the operational limitation exemptions, uh, we have uh, for all of the operators, the, oper the operators here means the, uh, such as the government agencies, uh, firms, companies, or the societies, they can get the qualification of the to be an operator. Uh, as soon as they submit general operations manuals uh, and approved by the CAA, uh, they, then they can operational limitation waivers by CAA. Uh, right now, we have uh, adopted all of the very similar uh, drone operation limitations, which are just uh, effective in uh, EU, uh, which means the, you, not, uh, you cannot only, uh, you only can operate drone in the daylight and uh, under the 400 feet, or you cannot uh, uh, operate beyond uh, visual line of sight uh, unless you get permit from the CAA, such as uh, operation limitations. But the operators, if they get some approval, they need uh, it is uh, OK to do so, to get some feasibility to operate to the, uh, the... Next, please. OK, here is a more detail uh, the process to get waivers from the operators. Uh, uh, I need to emphasize that only the government agencies, legal persons, which means a company or firms or schools, uh, get the uh, so-called uh, accreditation to do so. Uh, for the personal person, just like the individuals, it is not allowed to get the waivers to uh, to get exchange of the all of the operation limitations. Uh, that is the point I need to point out. Uh, next, please. Okay, for the medium or the environment, which is very similar to the uh, uh, everywhere around the world, we adopt uh, 400 feet uh, rules, which means the CAA or the uh, central government will operate the, will control the higher level of the space. But for the airspace in the lower space, such as uh, under 400 feet, it will be um, management by the local authorities will announce the no-fly zone to uh, to control the some uh, security or the for the safety uh, reasons to announce such a, such areas. This is the very uh, common way to do so. The next, please. Okay, uh, by introducing the technology, new technology such as the GIS or the uh, mobile techniques. So we provided uh, one one step, which means all of the process can be uh, get permissions or uh, get applications from the website. Uh, not only the all of the administrative process, but also the uh, APP we also provide to get the geo awareness for every person to operate the drones in Taiwan. Next, please. Okay, uh, finally, uh, we are talking about the compare with the manned aircraft. In manned aircraft, we have an ATM system, air traffic management system, but for the UAS, right now we are seeking the UTM uh, possibilities to manage not only the air traffic or UAS activities, but also in the airspace. Uh, in the traditional, we have airspace uh, class A, B, C, such as the uh, to classify the different usage of the airspace. But the, for the drone or the UAV, uh, we are still consider uh, the 400 feet is not very effective way to do so. So we can uh, we are seeking the more effective way to arrange the airspace in Taiwan. Uh, for the objective, uh, the main machine method. Uh, median or measures uh, is the way we want to do to operate the to operate the drone operate uh, to provide drone operation safely in Taiwan uh, by the support of the communication navigation and the surveillance techniques 
uh, in the year, maybe right now or in the future. I think this is conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gun. Next, I would like to introduce Mr. Yu Zhe Huang, Associate Researcher, Institute of Transportation, MOTC. He will present us the UAV industry promotion in Taiwan. I'll give the floor to Mr. Huang. Thank you, Angela. Okay. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Huang Yuzhe from the Institute of Transportation, or IoT for short. In terms of UAV in Taiwan, CAA plays a role as a regulator, as Mr. Gen just mentioned. And IoT uh, is responsible for the further integration and the industrial innovation for UAV industry. That's what I'm going to share today. Next, please. A today's presentation, we will start focus on the development and uh, use cases in Taiwan's UAV, and followed by government strategies and action plans on promoting drone industry. Next, please. First of all, I would like to give us a brief understanding on UAV industry in Taiwan. One particular feature of Taiwan's UAV is that the industry is composed of uh, many small and medium-sized enterprises. Also, most of them are small companies. There's still a complete R&D and the manufacturing supply chain for small drones. However, there are few manufacturers have the abilities and the experience on system integration and the testing. Several of them has a uh, relatively robust capabilities. We take NCSIST as, a, as an example. It's a military background research institution, expanding their business outreach to civil industry in recent years. Based on its experience on developing military drones, they are currently assisting the government, which is CAA, in UAV type certification. And speaking of a uh, service provider, Aerial photography and the survey takes the most part of the market. There's also a growing demand on inspection and agriculture. Next, please. So, yeah, yes. On the application side, bridge and the roll size rope inspection technology are quite mature in Taiwan. Our applications are mostly on the government side, like uh, disaster prevention and law enforcement. Emerging markets, including agricultural spray and uh, wind turbines infection, and some, some companies have already started testing on drone delivery. Next. The following are some use cases in transportation because I'm working in the uh, Institute of Transportation. Bridge and the roadside slope infection is, is currently one of the main applications of UAV in Taiwan. The use of UAV helps to inspect the bridge and the roadside slope that are difficult to humans to reach. Taiwan's road authority have already formed a drone fleet and train, and, and train pilots on their own. They also use artificial intelligence to detect potential risks of landslides or structural defects or bridges. Next, please. Next, I am going to share uh, a case from my department. The IoT uh, is currently using drone to analyze uh, inter road intersection conflicts. Drone has a wider pers perspective, which makes up the traditional shortcomings of CCTV. If if you see the picture on the left, the red dots represent high collision risk, and the yellow ones represent median risk, and so on. Please next. The last, case, the, last, the last case is drone delivery. It's one of the key applications of the future UAV industry. Since 2018, we have carried out a series of tests, in, including the delivery, uh, delivery of packages and the media supplies. This year, we will conduct a challenging test in southern Taiwan, from Pintong City, fly 15 kilometers to an offshore island to deliver, deliver mail. We hope to gain experience on drone delivery through this test this year. The test will, the test will be taking place uh, 
in uh, in air policy year. Next, please. Here we summarize uh, some challenges of Taiwan's UAV industry. Overall, because of uh, Taiwan's drone industry is dominated by small companies, it lacks sufficient fine funds and uh, a unified R&D strategy. In addition, there's still no large-scale large UAV test sites in Taiwan. Also, talent cultivation is, is also an issue. We need more students and uh, researchers focus on the UAVs. Next, please. The opportunities we have seen in the short term, including the growing market in inspection, agricultural de delivery, and the current US ban on DVI. Look, if you, we look into the long term, we need, we need to keep up with our fellow Asian countries in developing urban air mobility. These countries have already teamed up with industry leaders like Airbus, Volocopter, or Bell. Taiwan has advantages in aerospace and ICT industry, so we must start thinking what's our next next step. <clears throat> next, please. The first step is to build a national joint in, joint industry alliance. We call call it U Team for now. We hope to integrate R and D strategy and concentrate research resource on key areas such as e voto and see cooperations with major international le uh, leaders in industry. We have started a cross-departmental conversation within the government and with the industry. Our goal is to officially assemble a U team in the end of this year. Next, please. Here's, here's our roadmap. In addition to the U team, in the short term, we borrow the idea from FAA, start our own uh, integra UAV integration pilot, pilot program to expand application of UAV. And the talent cultivation are also our priorities. Our main term goal is to build a national and a regional test sites. These sites will be very important to develop UTM and UAM. And the UTM must go first to realize UAM. Speaking of UTM and UAM, they are our main term to long term goals. Before that, we need to carry our research and testing on relatively unrelated technologies. And most important, we need to build public, public confidence on these technologies. Please be note that uh, the exact schedule of UTN and UON still need a further discussion with CAN and, and the other, other authorities. Please, next. Finally, our goal in this year. Uh, the first, like I mentioned, is to build the industry alliance and start international interactions, like today's workshop. Hopefully, will will be a further cooperation after the pandemic. In terms of technolo technological development, we will focus on UAM and UTM, work closely with our partners in industry and academia. And also, we have begun preparations for the national test site this year. Thanks. Thank you for listening today. Thank you. There's a question about uh, considering DNSs uh, for vertical operation. So could you help us okay. to answer this question? OK, uh, I would like to elaborate more on that. Uh, I think that is uh, that's the reason why we are here <laughs> right now. Uh, for the operation drone operation in Taiwan, we, we got two rules for the operators. Uh, one is if you uh, operate operated drones under the 400 feet, uh, you use the data of the above AGL above ground level, which means the, the data will come in uh, from the terrain following. But for the people who operate the drone uh, above 400 feet, we ask them to use the, the other data, which means the mean sea level uh, calculated from the the, from the sea level, and then uh, prior to the fly, they need to prepare all of the data and uh, uh, to issue the notice to notify the people. Because in the general aviation or in the manned aircraft uh, operations, we use mean sea level uh, in daily operation. So in the in the note, we need to do that uh, by calculating the mean sea level, which means they need to 
uh, the operator of the drones needed to do some conversion to calculate the the data. And uh, of course, this is not very effective way. So that is the reason why we are seeking the, the other ways, such as the uh, Galileo's or the other constellations, we can accurately correct, uh, accurately calculate the uh, vertical uh, data for the drones operation. Uh, which can enhance the safety and uh, uh, to provide uh, accurate uh, uh, data for drone operation. I think maybe uh, from the academy, uh, they uh, they can also provide the other solutions, but I think this is the way we are going to do and uh, seeking for the possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gun. We have other questions that you feel free to drop your question on the right side of the chat box and then we will be able to reply to you later on. Now I'm going to have the floor to our moderator, Heiner, so to go and continue the panel discussion. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me now. Um, well, uh, we're running a little bit late, um, but we're, I'm sure we have enough time for the um, for the panel here. First, we'll see a number of presentations from four distinguished speakers. I have the pleasure to introduce the European speakers in there. We have the first European speaker will be Kuhn Möllmann from Unifly in Belgium. A little bit of background about Unifly. It's a spin-off from the famous research institute Vito. They got spun off last year, and their ambition is to enable the integration of drone traffic around the world through development of unmanned air traffic management solutions. They already have offices in various places. Maybe Kuhn will explain a little bit more about that. Um, they have also been involved in one of the research projects indicated by Carmen from the GSA earlier and probably there might be an interesting partner to partner with on the upcoming Horizon Europe or other research projects. The other partner who will speak later is Space Opal. We'll have the COO, Andre Bauerhin speaking. Space Opal is a joint venture by the DLR, Gesellschaft für Raumfahrtanwendungen, let's call it short, short, short TFR. It's a joint venture between DLR and Telespazio. It's the prime contractor of the Galileo system. So they know a lot about the Galileo system, I can assure you. And they have created a technology framework dedicated to innovation, research, and development for new solutions. This is called NAFCAST. The NAFCAST precise point positioning services. And we're looking forward to hear from Andre more about that. Before we get started, um, Angela, would you mind introducing the Taiwanese speakers of the panel. Yes. So uh, they are the panelists. The first one is uh, Dr. Lin, Professor Lin Ting Yi. Um, he's working for the UAV Center of Tangram Christian University. And they are undertaking a primary test uh, UTM project uh, for, for the government for the research. So, Bring more about their uh, testing and um, research about UTM in the lab. And also, the next uh, another uh, company in the panelist is Earthbrook. And um, Earthbrook is a Taiwanese company in the area of UAVs. It's a three a 4D platform with an UAV cloud service to upload and geotech imaginary. Publish and share this image in 4D and to integrate these with custom customized maps and tools. Our book's web service is based on an API which also includes real-time AIS and ADSB data to monitor vessels and airplanes in real time. The company's partners include Taiwan's National Space Organization, its Industrial Technology Research Institution, and other the one who joined us from Earthbrook is Dr. Li Ke, Li Ke Shu, a COO from Earth. Thank you. Yes. So the next speaker then is uh, Kuhn Möllemann from uh, Unifly in Belgium. Kuhn? Yeah, good morning, Europe. Good afternoon, Taiwan. <laughs> Thanks for the, for the interesting, uh, I would say, 
Uh, presentation still now. I think I saw very, very relevant, very similar issues as we have in Europe and, and, and worldwide, I guess. So uh, thanks for that. Thanks, thanks to the Taiwanese colleagues for, for, for this introduction. So Unifly, I'm one of the co-founders of Unifly, um, company founded in 2015. And, and a bit contrary to what Hannes said, we are a use space. We are a technology provider. Right? We are a software company developing UTM solutions. In some countries, we might be a an, uh, solution and on a service provider as well, but mainly we provide technical solutions to CAs and ASPs. Um, to start with, I just have just have a short introduction vi video where we see some features uh, and some uh, of our software. So um, yeah, you can start the video from my side. So we started in 2000. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So we started in 2015 um, um, with four people. We are now 65 people. I will quickly run through my slides, given the time. So what we at Unifly develop is a UTM product. Uh, we have uh, consisting out of our blip, I will come to that, but our main core is our UTM platform in which we have a mobile a web application and you see the application, the mobile application on the, on the right side. And you also have, you can also access the platform through API connections. A UTM platform consists of several features and, and services, of course. Um, and I saw already some mentioned by the CEA of Taiwan, uh, which is an operator and a pilot management we have. We have a planning and validation engine in which strategic deconfliction is a very important part. We have a flight authorization uh, module in which several authorities and level of responsibilities can, can approve or disapprove a flight or get uh, some extra information. We have a supervision tool for once, uh, I would say, the flights are airborne, where we can have some conformance monitor to see where the flights are doing what they are supposed to do. We have some tactical deconfliction tools. And of course, we have tracking and remote ID uh, implemented. I will come to that. After that, we also have reporting. Let's say that in case of an incident, we have a replay function. And we have also, uh, that is more relevant for the European uh, uh, legislation, GeoZone editor. And uh, I would say a drone web where users can, uh, and it was also present already in Taiwan, I saw, where users can already have a glimpse on the airspace which spaces are restricted and on a certain day and what are the limitations. Uh, next slide, please. As part of our UTM, uh, which is a software product, we also have a hardware product because of uh, tracking and, and, and being able to follow the zones, I would say is one of the key issues within UTM. So we developed our own, uh, what we call our BLIP, huh? which is our broadcast location and identification platform. Basically, it's a module which has uh, yeah, a GPS inside, and we have a uh, system which uh, uses both Galileo GPS and GLONASS. It also has a BLE, uh, a Bluetooth connection, and it also dispose of an LTE connection. So it's a base where you can use it both as a network remote ID or just as broadcast remote ID. So it enables to identify the drone and to know its position and even people uh, which have the, um, I would say the app on the smartphone, when they see flying a drone, they can make a connection through BLE and they can identify and see um, who's the operator of the drone and where it, uh, its intentions basically. Uh, next slide. Of course, uh, and that's, I would say, particularly interesting for, for the chat afterwards. Uh, we offer a, a UTM uh, module, but we are able, and depends on, I would say, the regions and the parts of the world, you have several implementations model. You have uh, sometimes a very centralized model where a lot of functionalities are with some local authorities or state authorities, or uh, just push one button, please. You have a more federated model. If you just click. Uh, yeah, voila, a more federated model where, let's say, use space of UTM services are, uh, I would say, more given towards the private sector and more open for competition. So our software uh, supports both implementations or everything in between, I would say. Uh, and there you see, the, of course, the architecture of that, of that software in that case. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this is our, I would say, developments through, um, of um, our layouts through the world. Um, we have our system implemented in Denmark, Germany, uh, the Belgian uh, ANSP and CEA. Uh, we are working in Finland. We had some tests with Hitachi in Japan. Auster Control is using it, so in Austria. But our biggest rollout currently ongoing is in Af Canada. So we are the, 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 the contractor to uh, Transport Canada and the, the Canadian ANSP, where we are rolling out their national UTM system uh, as we speak. Yeah, next slide. So, of course, I will not uh, go into details, but we are part of many, many working uh, standardization working groups. And uh, we have been since since the beginning, we were part of the with the Commission and EASA on the, on the rulemaking uh, of the use space in Europe. Uh, next slide. Um, but of course, yeah, what brings uh, GNS in general and Galileo towards UTM? I think two building blocks for UTM are, I would say, spatial information and connectivity. There's our clue, otherwise we don't, without those two features, we don't have a UTM, I would say. And um, so um, all the dreams we have about urban mobility, uh, drone delivery, they are all, I would say, linked to accurate spatial information. And in that extent, GNS and Galileo is, is an extreme importance. A lot of UTM services, which we are offering, like geo-awareness, ad tracking, conformance monitoring, tactical deconfliction, they are all relying and they can only improve when we have accurate spatial information. And, and generally for the drone industry, uh, overall, uh, complex operations in an urban landscape, like, for example, Taiwan, and, and BVLOS operations in general in urban area mobility, they can only happen when, uh, I would say, we have a... Uh, a sophisticated GNS and positioning system. They are key enablers for the drone industry, basically. Next slide, please. And that's uh, the slide to end with, basically. What we believe, uh, we are just at the beginning. Uh, we say we are, today we are working on UTM, what we call, uh, which is known as unmanned traffic management. We believe, anyhow, that in the future, maybe 10 years from now, UTM might become what we call unified traffic management, another acronym, because ATM and UTM, they will grow to each other. And probably in the future, 20 years, 15 years from now, I think all those systems will integrate in what we call basically urban traffic management, where even ground and airborne uh, mobility will be connected. And uh, I think that's the ultimate dream that we have with our software and with our company. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Lin. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to talk about the prim preliminary test of UTM in Taiwan. Next, please. Next, please. We build uh, a, a you know, hierarchical UTM system in Taiwan to uh, test the uh, feasibility operation for uh, uh, UV's uh, surveillance from the uh, internet system. And we design an ADSB-like communica communication infrastructure to uh, construct uh, to receive all UV flying in the airspace under surveillance, okay? And then we build this system into uh, regional UTM and uh, national UTM. Regional UTM covers uh, uh, 400 feet below, and about 400 feet will be uh, belong to a national UTM. Next, please. Regional UTM is uh, governed by the uh, local government. So that's just like uh, Mr. Ken uh, talked about. We divided the 400 feet to be, to be, become a, a local uh, management by the local government. Next, please. The UTM system is constructed by regional on the on the bottom, and then from from the 400 above will become a national UTM. So we will connect the data into uh, the national UTM system, and the national UTM system would be. Uh, possible to connect into the uh, uh, air traffic control system or air traffic control management system for huge operation with uh, ATCs. Thank you, next. And this is the uh, UTM control room uh, design in uh, Changlo University. Uh, this is a, a similar concept built by the ATM because uh, ATM monitor the uh, aircraft flying in the uh, airspace and then the UTM will monitor the uh, UAVs flying in the uh, uh, local airspace. Thank you. Next. And we build the uh, uh, UTM by using the LoRa system. And then we build LoRa gateways uh, in southern part of Taiwan. The red circles will be the LoRa gateways and the 
blue circles, we use uh, APRS for the coverage. And then we build the uh, uh, unit to uh, put a uh, build on the, on the aircraft to fly so we can uh, uh, monitor the air UAVs all around in the airspace. Thank you. Next. And then this is yes. The feet is quite low, and we can cover a size into twenty thousand feet. But uh, um, you know, for for the feasible operation, we we like to cover all the four hundred feet into the airspace. Next, please. And then in conclusion, for the ETM system, we have been constructed the uh, uh, regional. ETM system in Thailand city. And then the, within this month, we will build another uh, seven lower gateways to cover you know, the southern part of Taiwan. And in the next year, we would like to uh, build all the coverage for Taiwan uh, island-wide. The fly test in the GTS verifies that we have complete the uh, uh, regional and, uh, uh, and the local area uh, UTM operation. Okay, and we would like to, to uh, build more uh, uh, operation system for taste in the uh, next uh, one or two years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Lin. So next I would like to introduce Dr. Li Keshu, CEO of Earthbrook, Taiwan. I'll give the floor to Dr. Li. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, our company is called Earthbrook Incorporated and our uh, product is also called Earthbrook. It is a 4D uh, dust platform. Later, I will discuss this later. Okay, next. Okay, so uh, we are uh, you know, a startup company uh, just from uh, 2018. And uh, right now, we are the provider of a supply country of government for a uh, dust, dust service. Uh, and in this year, uh, in this year, we also be a partner, uh, be a member of a Microsoft uh, Startup uh, Accelerator. So our company, uh, we, uh, we develop a, a, a Earthbook 4D platform by our by our own. And uh, that's, uh, the Earthbook XYZ is our uh, website, so you can get a free register and test. And for our uh, our tech, uh, uh, cloud service in. Uh, Originally, uh, Earthbook is a SaaS service, including uh, uh, processing uh, drone da data and uh, get uh, a little bit of AI analysis. So, uh, including the DAS service, uh, a drone service, we can be a uh, one-stop uh, shopping uh, for drone service. Next, please. Okay. This is the real case. This, uh, this is a uh, drone fly in Taipei City. And then we use the uh, live stream uh, for AI analysis for traffic flow. So in the left hand side, you can see we, uh, in our platform, uh, you can see the drone, uh, drone po uh, position and the drone's uh, FOV, uh, even the drone track. So a uh, user can e as e easily use this platform to know where the drone is. And uh, the, using the uh, live streaming analysis, a uh, user can do some AI processing. Right now, we provide the tra uh, traffic uh, flow like the uh, right hand side. You can see the uh, left, uh, uh, up corner show the uh, uh, traffic flow direction, speed, and uh, uh, counts. Next, please. Okay, this is another a tra a traditional case the user use uh, our platform. Uh, people can upload the uh, uh, also map on our platform, even the uh, 3D models. And the uh, uh, user can do some management on our site. We provide a, a management tool like a uh, distance area, even the uh, volume. So this is the traditional use. So this is our advantage. So next, please. Okay. So for uh, our experience, uh, we right now we cooperate uh, with our partner to develop the uh, UTN uh, approved uh, system. 
So for this, uh, you can see this is just prototype for the UTN review system. The left hand side, you can see there is a, a, fly, a fly plane, but the, uh, the fly, high, uh, fly attitude is just uh, 25 uh, ASL, but this is against to the ATM, uh, to the, uh, against to the DTM. So this application should be rejected. So for uh, using this uh, 3D uh, platform, a uh, uh, user can easily to see uh, the condition of the flight plan. So in the uh, right hand side, you can see the there are several uh, flight plans in the same area. And uh, you can see the button is uh, the time when the drone fly. Next, please. Okay, this is the, the, the case for the FAA uh, UPP, uh, UPP2 demo. You can see for the showcase, the left hand side is the um, UAB uh, remote ID broadcast uh, information, the including the uh, IDs, even, even the uh, different uh, uh, altitude, like the uh, uh, altitude from bar uh, barrel meter or from uh, GPS, but these two uh, altitude is uh, very different. Like the uh, previous uh, present uh, users said, uh, the altitude uh, accuracy is different uh, from GPS. And the right hand side is the uh, 3D uh, track uh, track from the uh, flight plan. So we know uh, for the uh, UTM system. The 3D uh, 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 platform is need for the UTM system. Next, please. So this is the real case for our test. So for the uh, for the DJI uh, drone, we provide the the control app, and this app can through the 4G uh, transfer the real uh, real time position of drone to our uh, platform. And this platform can set a uh, arm area for drone. So this system will similar to the AI uh, system uh, we we use right now, like the left hand side, and uh, even the collision alarm uh, alarm uh, management. This uh, this two uh, system is similar. So next, next please, okay. So the change for UTM in Taiwan, there are, I think there are just four should be uh, mentioned. So uh, GNSS uh, is a foundation for remote ID of drone, uh, of uh, especially the drone attitude, because the drone attitude is very important for body trajectory management. And others, you, uh, you can see the others. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Mr. Lee. Um, and before we move to the Q&A and uh, the discussion, um, we would have the presentation uh, from, uh, from Space Opal, from Mr. Uh, Bowen, and I will be sharing the presentation in one second. Today, I will elaborate a bit uh, about uh, the enabling services for UTM applications. Um, before I uh, come uh, to that one, maybe next slide, uh, I would like to spend a few words uh, about uh, Space Opal. I mean, as already introduced uh, by Rainer, Space Opal has been established now 12 years ago by the German Aerospace Center, together with our Italian partner, uh, Telespazio. And uh, since then, we are the service operator of the Europe's uh, global satellite navigation system, Galileo, uh, which is funded and deployed by the European Commission. And uh, now since uh, four years, uh, we are uh, supporting the GSA and we are operating the system on behalf of the GSA and providing uh, to users worldwide first-class satellite-based navigation services. Um, just to give you a glance overview, uh, I mean, to what, what is required yeah, to deliver the Galileo navigation services. Uh, um, we are operating together with an industrial team 
currently a constellation of 26 satellites in medium Earth orbit by means of uh, two satellite control centers in Germany and in Italy and a GNSS service center based in Madrid and uh, a ground station network uh, which has been deployed worldwide and is, let's say today at the status equipped with more than uh, 44 antennas uh, to serve uh, the Galileo system. So, but a part of our, let's say, uh, core business to operate uh, the constellation and to provide Galileo navigation services as part of our innovation lab, uh, we have developed uh, roughly two years ago a GNSS precise point positioning services and related application uh, which are delivering uh, for a worldwide basis uh, uh, correction data uh, to uh, interested uh, users and or both on institutional and commercial uh, side to achieve positioning errors below centimeter level. Maybe next slide. So following a series of pre-development uh, of three developments, our NAFCAST service and uh, the application series have been first launched in October 2018. And since that point of time, it's undergoing continuous technology improvements and evolutions. Today, the core service of NAFCAST is providing real-time uh, orbit and clock corrections for all the constellations, Galileo, GPS, GLONASS, and Baidu, as well as uh, differential code bias and phase bias. Uh, to enable ambiguity resolution at uh, the end user receiver side. And uh, we complemented these services just recently uh, with providing uh, additionally ionospheric corrections uh, to end users. And uh, soon in spring of this year, uh, we will add uh, tropospheric corrections so that you have with NAFCAST the whole bench of correction data uh, you need uh, to, uh, um, yeah, to, uh, to access, let's say, high accurate uh, navigation services. So all these uh, results uh, will provide already today in a reliable manner centimeter accuracy as already set and rapid convergence uh, time uh, at uh, end user side. So the only thing what you require at the end is a compatible um, receiver equipment with an appropriate PPP algorithm. And uh, we believe, or I believe, strongly believe that our platform is ready to provide uh, uh, future solutions, which are, let's say, tailored for UTM applications. Uh, and uh, we are featuring, intending to feature authentication uh, of positioning information to achieve uh, a safe and reliable operational environment. And uh, let's say on our long-term uh, development roadmap, we are also intending to implement integrity information so that our navigation service, NAVCAST, can be considered also for safety critical uh, decisions. Um, next slide, please, Hannes. So to show you already, let's say, an application of NAVCAST in the UTM sector, so here specifically, I selected a drone application carrying our latest development, NAVCAST uh, multi-constellation receiver uh, to generate its position uh, solution over the uh, entire dynamic flight trajectory. And I will show you later also a few uh, results of that. Um, in that scenario, our NAVCAST receiver, which is called 3PRX, is using uh, uh, GNSS signal in space observables uh, and uh, the NAVCAST real-time correction uh, stream, which in that specific application has been sourced uh, via LTE. However, uh, the, uh, the receiver is also, let's say, to plug in Iridium card to enable communications, uh, satellite-based communications uh, for long-term uh, distance communication. And uh, to verify the performance, uh, we uh, set up an RTK environment uh, on ground with the base station closed uh, to the flight site. And uh, the drone was carrying not only the NAVCAST receiver, but also the RTK rover receiver, 
which have been both connected uh, to the same uh, GNSS onboard uh, antenna so that we have an appropriate setup uh, to validate, let's say, uh, the 3 prx receiver against an RTK reference. Uh, maybe next slide, Hannes. So next slide uh, is uh, just showing you a few impressions uh, from the flight carried out at our uh, flight site in Oberfaufenhofen in Germany. And uh, the platform you see under known the drone was not to carry the NAFCAST receiver, but <laughs> to carry the RTK rover and uh, antenna splitter equipment and uh, battery and communication equipment. Uh, next slide, please. So what you see here is uh, <clears throat> at the end uh, the plots uh, over uh, the flight time, which indicate to you that uh, we have uh, started uh, with a rapid convergence of the PPP algorithm on board. And uh, you see that the four dimensional navigation performance, so vertical, long track and timing accuracy remains uh, stable uh, during uh, the highly dynamic flight phases uh, of the drone. And uh, it can be seen, uh, of course, I cannot zoom in, but you can uh, trust me uh, that uh, uh, the dynamic NAFCAST position solution is comparable to the RTK solution. But here again, and this is, I think, uh, the main uh, benefit of PPP at the end, precise point positioning service, that you don't need uh, uh, a local external infrastructure for generating these results. So next slide, Hannes. So um, on these plots, uh, in principle, you see that uh, the standard deviation between PPP and RTK in that setup, horizontal and vertically, is uh, less than 10 centimeters. And uh, I think this is a quite yeah, impressive uh, proof uh, on the capability uh, of uh, using PPP uh, for, uh, for, for drone applications. So next slide, oh, yeah, thank you. Um, so how, how we see the role of GNSS for UTM applications. I mean, first of all, I mean, GNSS based positioning is considered a key element and especially uh, Galileo uh, provides here uh, significant advantages. I mean, just to name one, which is linked to the OS NMA feature, which is being, uh, let's say, currently under validation, but being launched soon. Uh, by the GSA as a service uh, to end user. Um, we will make for sure use of it uh, twofold in that case. Yeah, I mean, we have for the uh, NAFCAS PPP service, of course, are employing uh, a global reference station network and uh, we are intending to uh, equip uh, and change our receivers uh, there uh, to en enhance our anti-spoofing resistance. Yeah? so that uh, at the end malicious signals will be cancelled prior uh, to uh, the NAFCAST uh, uh, processing already at the reference uh, station site so that uh, uh, we are generating the correction data free of uh, let's say uh, feared events. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, complementary to this uh, OS NMA feature, and uh, of course, I mean, there are other constellations uh, 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 which are not providing this feature. Yeah? We do uh, additional research uh, and we are hopefully able to launch uh, towards the end of the year already, let's say, prototype services in that case yeah? before we go on the market. Uh, on second level protection means uh, to uh, detect uh, radio frequency interferences and spoofing attacks uh, by employing uh, artificial uh, intelligence algorithms uh, uh, within our uh, service uh, platform. So maybe Hannes, na last slide, uh, just uh, to give you a, an overview, not only about the service uh, and correction data we are providing, but also uh, for completeness, a few examples of our user applications. So as already said, the 3 prx receiver has been used during this drone flight. Um, maybe one point I didn't mention, but maybe which is important also for your RTM application is noted that the receiver itself has interfaces with external senders, of course, but also um, 
uh, the uh, returning capability. Yeah? So that uh, at the end, uh, the precise uh, positioning data can be feedbacked uh, to the operator, including additional information. Then uh, we also uh, launched our 3 pjo app, the smartphone app where you can test uh, PPP performance uh, on your compatible smartphone. Uh, I have to say there are not yet many smartphones uh, uh, on the market, uh, which are, let's say, uh, providing the raw data output uh, in order to enable uh, the PPP algorithm uh, to provide high accuracy solution on the devices. But uh, it's growing, yeah? you can try it. Uh, it's uh, free available on the Google Play Store. And uh, complementary for the users, uh, which are uh, uh, using our NAFCAS correction data service, uh, they uh, can also use uh, our batch of uh, application, desktop applications uh, for post-processing uh, in support uh, of uh, the NAFCAS services uh, provided. Thank you very much uh, to listen to me. Well, thank you, Andre, uh, for this nice contribution here. I think we have a nice overview of how you complement GNSS with your own Enoughcast solution. Um, let's go now into the Q&A uh, with all the speakers and also embrace in that Carmen Aguilera from the GSA. Um, we, we're already seeing a bit of discussion going in the inside the chat box bilaterally. So some of the more detailed questions have already been addressed. Um, so please come up with any other question, uh, mark your, uh, raise a hand or put the question into the chat that we can bring it up and make a discussion here. Before we do so, I have a question for the European speaker participants. And I'd like to know, do you have any existing activities in Taiwan already? And if so, maybe you can elaborate what your business activities were and how you plan to approach the Taiwanese market. And if so, have you identified any obstacles in doing so? Maybe the institutional representatives in the call here can help you or point you to possible solutions. So, Mr. Paul, let me fly it. Maybe you want to. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, let's say. Um, we have been in touch, I think, what is it, two years ago with the Taiwanese operator, let's say, to, to, to get knowledge on the Taiwanese market. But that collaboration was, a, uh, was quite difficult to establish. And, and honestly, we did not manage to get in touch with, 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 with the officials. And I'm very happy that we have people from the CEA here on board and that we can uh, elaborate further contact. So generally, let's say, um, in the Asian market, we are. We have a, a partnership with with uh, one of our Japanese, I would say, shareholders, which is Teradrone, and uh, they are, I would say, the drone operator. So we try to, let's say, address the, the the Asian market through them. Although it's not so easy, I think, for us as a European company. On the other hand, for example, Volocopter did the trials in Singapore, and there, for example, we were part of that trial. Uh, we we equipped uh, the Volocopter with our blip device. So yes, let's say for us, it's just starting, and we have been focusing mainly on Europe. And okay, now we, uh, we were active in Canada, but I think for us, the next step is definitely uh, see what we can do and uh, see where we can get great partnerships with Asian uh, colleagues. Thank you. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Uh, I also see there is a discussion. That thanks, about, thanks for the response about authentication. The unique feature of Galileo, in order to use this feature for ULV and UTM, do we need to use those GNSS receivers which provide this capability, such a service or solution from NAFCAST? I guess this question is clearly for Andre. Do you need any specific receivers? What do the receivers need to do to make it happen? I mean, in principle, yes, you need specific uh, receivers. Uh, as Carmen already, uh, let's say, explained uh, that uh, Europe has also in GSA specifically has uh, started the development uh, of this kind of, uh, of receivers uh, in, uh, in order to access uh, the signal at intermediate frequency level. So there are some, let's say, uh, specific developments necessary uh, in order to enable use of uh, the OSNMA feature at receiver side. So it's not, let's say, a standard receiver uh, you can uh, buy on the market, which automatically will enable you uh, to use uh, OS Galileo OSNMA. Okay. 
Thank you. Now, uh, question, are there any more questions in the chat? Please put them in. I saw in the chat, uh, uh, adding to that, that there has been a uh, bilateral discussion um, between Mr. Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Kung and Unifly, who are talking bilaterally about uh, um, uh, compatibility and compliance with certain standards, which is positive. Maybe Kun, could you briefly el elaborate on that about the ASTM 3411 uh, and your compatibility with Unifly? <laughs> yeah, let's say uh, one of the slides I showed is that we were quite active in some older standardization groups. It had to do with the standard on the remote ID, and that's basically what 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 the drone um, is requested of us to broadcast. It's requested to broadcast its position, its heading, its altitude, uh, a registration number as well. So, um, and that's a bit the red race between I would say standardization groups. It's a bit weird. ASTM is the American standard, which has been issued and approved by the FAA. I think uh, and officially published a few weeks ago. Uh, we have been part of that working group, so we are compliant with that. On the other side, Europe has also working on an own standard, which is almost similar, but not completely the same. So it, the, the difference are, let's say, what is exactly broadcast, the way it's broadcast, these are the differences. But basically, um, it's both of them broadcast and uh, the identity and the position of the UAV through a BLE, through Bluetooth technology. Um, that's basically the, I would say, the thing about those standards. Uh, if I make, um, Hannes, I also had a question for Professor Lin, because I saw that the testing on, uh, they were using LoRa technology. As far as I know, LoRa is broadcasting technology, which is uh, in Europe quite a lot used for IoT devices. I was just wondering if LoRa offers enough bandwidth and enough update rate to broadcast the position of a drone. Uh, in Europe, we are rather looking to... Um, uh, mobile network, which I saw on uh, 4G, 5G, rather than the LoRa technology, which was considered not to be enough for this. Do you have any comments on this, Professor Lin? Yes, uh, we tried uh, the uh, 4Gs or even the uh, 5Gs, uh, but the altitude coverage cannot as high as uh, 400 feet. And using LoRa, we can uh, build, you know, uh, ground transceiver stations to cover uh, wider than 15 kilometers radius. So in Tainan City, we have already constructed uh, five LoRa gateway uh, transceiver stations to cover all the Tainan County. Okay, and then we fly it uh, maybe more than 100 times to get uh, very good coverage for uh, UAV surveillance. And currently, we are constructing the uh, gateway stations uh, in the into the southern part of Taiwan. So from the uh, uh, figure as you can see, we cover uh, almost uh, uh, half of Taiwan using about uh, 20 uh, gateways to uh, sub, sub, to monitor all the UAVs flying in the uh, low altitudes. Okay, so that's uh, how we try to develop. And then uh, we will build a uh, lower onboard unit. The cost uh, from here is about uh, uh, less than 100 US dollar. Okay, mm -hmm. so we can uh, uh, easily, uh, you know, you know, distribute to the users that uh, that they can hook on the uh, UAVs to uh, use it and then fly under the, the uh, uh, you know, ninety nine percent surveillance. Okay, and uh, for the gateways, the cost for the gateway is about uh, uh, three thousand US dollar each. Okay, then we have a uh, contract with. Uh, Chonghua uh, Telecommunication Station, to, to telecommunication company to uh, use their uh, uh, system to, uh, to receive all the uh, uh, downlink data into the uh, cloud system. So we, we started from the cloud system to uh, uh, monitor all the UAVs flying in the low altitudes, and then we can share the data to the uh, operators or the uh, you know providers to, to help them to uh, monitor their own uh, UAVs. So that's the system we are constructing now. Okay. okay. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you very much for these questions. There is one last question um, we would like to ask to Carmen, if that's okay, um, to, to end our workshop today. And sorry for being a little bit over time. 
Um, you've mentioned uh, a number of uh, Horizon 2020 projects. Actually, with GNSS Asia, we're an example of a Horizon 2020 project. Now Horizon Europe is coming. I can assume or I can imagine there is a lot happening in the area of, of uh, UTM uh, research and the related use of GNSS. Um, are there any calls coming? And is this open to participation uh, from Taiwan? We have a number of academia here. Um, what's the situation there from the GSA side? Yes, indeed. Uh, as uh, you anticipated, uh, the uh, Horizon 2020 is uh, coming to an end, and now the European Union is uh, setting up the continuation, the program that uh, continues after Horizon 2020, that is called uh, Horizon Europe. The Commission is uh, finalizing the shaping of uh, this program that is planned uh, to start in 2021. Uh, do, we don't have yet uh, the figures of the budget that will go into GNSS uh, research, but uh, there will be budget allocated to this, and, uh, and hopefully the next calls uh, will come soon. Uh, normally, I would assume that the rules uh, for participation should be similar to the ones in Horizon 2020, so Taiwanese um, entities, uh, industry and academia uh, should be eligible to, to apply. But again, the, it is, uh, the program is not uh, finalized uh, yet. However, since uh, we have the link uh, with the uh, Tau Taiwanese uh, partners uh, via GNSS Asia, as soon as the program is, is defined, uh, we can transfer the information or also organize a dedicated uh, webinar if you think it is useful for the Taiwanese partners. Thank you very much for that, Carmen. Um, so indeed, uh, as under GNSS Asia, we're, we're glad to distribute that information. And if there's any, if there are any questions from the Taiwanese side in the next few uh, months uh, and even years on Horizon uh, Europe, always glad and at your disposal to assist you. So hereby, uh, I would first and foremost like to thank um, all the speakers who have been here today uh, from Europe and Taiwan and that in, in COVID times and remotely, it's been a pleasure to welcome you at this workshop. Um, personally, I found it a very and extremely interesting discussion and that is demonstrated by the fact that our uh, chat currently is super interactive between panelists and participants. I hope this is just the beginning of our discussions and not the end of it. Um, in the chat, you have seen that we have posted a number of, of links and our um, email address as well. We are at your disposal anytime to make a connection, to make a contact. We can organize a bilateral site meeting should you have identified anyone from Taiwan or Europe you'd like to be in touch with. Now, uh, as a next step uh, uh, under GNSS Asia, we will uh, be at the Munich Satellite Navigation Summit for industry matchmaking. It will have an international dimension and more information will appear soon on our website um, uh, with all the details for registration. So please join us there and we will keep you on the loop, uh, in the loop proactively. Um, late in March, we have a workshop focusing on the ASEAN region, uh, focusing on uh, emergency and maritime solutions using GNSS. And in spring, spring 21, there will be a full week online event, um, two hours a day focusing on specific European GNSS technologies, um, where you can learn the latest and greatest on the EU GNSS market, but also what is happening in Asia. And we welcome all participants from Taiwan and Europe to join us there. 